Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, and esteemed online participants. I'm Chang, one of the nephrologists in the University of Malaya Medical Center. I would like to welcome all of you to this live webinar series, Breakfast at UM Health, Episode 9. So today's webinar holds special significance as it is held in conjunction with the celebration of World Kidney Day 2024. World Kidney Day is a global health awareness campaign focusing on the, highlighting the importance of kidney health and also reducing the frequency and impact of kidney disease worldwide. So as many of you have already know, World Kidney Day is observed annually on the second Thursday in March, uh, which is uh, March 14 this year. So this year, the theme for World Kidney Day revolves around advancing equitable access to care and optimal medication practice. Chronic kidney disease or CKD remains a significant global health challenge affecting over 850 million people worldwide and resulting in over 3.1 million deaths in 2019 alone. Alarmingly, CKD ranks as the eighth leading cause of death globally, with projections indicating that it could rise to the fifth leading cause of years of life loss by 2040 if not addressed properly. Locally, in Malaysia, the prevalence of a CKD has been on the rise, uh, reaching approximately 15.5% in 2018, compared to 9% in 2011. Our Malaysian Dialysis and Transplant Registry in 2022 reported nearly 9,600 new dialysis patients and a total of 51,000 dialysis patients in 2022 alone. So without effective interventions, uh, Malaysia could expect over 106,000 patients uh, living on dialysis by 2040. So today we gather under the banner of ensuring that every individual, regardless of their background or location, has access to timely and equitable care to combat CKD effectively. And one crucial aspect of this care is dialysis access care, which plays a vital role in the management of advanced CKD. And who better to shed light on this topic than our guest, esteemed guest speaker for today, Dr. Gan Chai Chung. Dr. Gan is a board certified general physician and nephrologist with European Nephrology Specialty Certification. His expertise lies in the dialysis access care and intervention having pursued further training in interventional nephrology in complex endovascular interventions in Singapore and Japan under the banner of International Society of Nephrology. So without further ado, I invite you all to join me in welcoming Dr. Gan as he presents his talk on equitable access to dialysis access care. Over to you, Dr. Gan. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cheng, for your kind introduction. And first of all, I also would like to thank uh, Faculty of Medicine for inviting me to give uh, this talk. And uh, let me share for a while. Okay, today I'm going to talk about this uh, equitable access to dialysis access care for the, uh, for the, for the end-stage kidney patients and also mainly on this equitable access to the interventional nephrologist for the involvement in dialysis access care as a team. Well, dialysis access preparation actually starts from the st uh, stage 3 uh, chronic kidney disease, whereby at this stage of the GFR of 30 and below, uh, patients should be educated on all modalities of the kidney replacement therapy options. While the GFR in between 15 to 20, individual uh, individual ESKD life plan should be discussed, meaning that we should plan we should have already planned the, the life plan on whether to transplant um, uh, on parietal dialysis or uh, dialysis, hemodialysis. And patient also should be referred for a dialysis assessment, dialysis ex assessment and subsequent atrial venous fistula creation uh, if the progression deemed fast and, and uh, at the stage of 15. Okay, at this stage also, a very late stage of 15, uh, we can actually place the PD catheter at least two weeks before the anticipated need. Whereas for the AVF creation, it should be six months prior to the expected initiation of the dialysis. And what, if ones have this uh, end-stage kidney disease or end-stage renal disease, what happens next? One can choose option of peritoneal dialysis or known as water dialysis or hemodialysis or what we know as a blood dialysis or kidney transplant or even palliative, uh, 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 palliative care. But majority or some of the patients who do not have this access to the dialysis will eventually pass on. And it's a bit different from palliation because palliation gives a comfort, 
uh, care uh, before the pass on. Well, before establishing this uh, parental dialysis treatment or or this uh, uh, hemodialysis treatment, access is important, whereby we will insert the tank of catheter or known as a PD catheter for patients who wish to undergo uh, this peritoneal dialysis, whereas for this uh, hemodialysis will be a fistula creation. And this is the incident and peritoneal dialysis caused an excess operators in Southeast Asia. The paper by Ramachandran also touched on Malaysia. And surprisingly, there were unplanned initiation as high as 65%. And majority are started with uh, non-calf dialysis, uh, non-calf, uh, non-tunnel dialysis catheter, which is 67%. And dialysis access came in the form of uh, central venous catheter, which includes tunnel calf catheter or non-tunnel calf catheter, also known as temporary dialysis catheter. For water dialysis or, or peritoneal dialysis will be tank calf catheter. And for hemodialysis will be AVF or AVG. What is dialysis access care? The care actually starts from timely creation, regular maintenance and surveillance and nursing care, salvage, termination, and also recreation. Okay, for this Hemodialysis catheter will be a change of temporary dialysis catheter to a tunnel cuff catheter, which is uh, uh, more better in the sense of less uh, thrombosis and also less uh, infection, mainly is less infection. For AVF AVG, we need to actually uh, create six months prior to the anticipated use so that give enough window time for uh, access creation or maturation. PD access two weeks prior to anticipated use. And at the regular maintenance and surveillance and nursing care, will be CRSPI uh, catheter blood stream infection uh, uh, prevention for catheter, AVF, AVG for uh, fistoplasty, PD catheter, which is blocked, can be solved by urocanus lock or brushing at salvage area, uh, like patient with uh, tunnel cuff catheter with limited access, uh, uh, getting infection from CRBSI. And we know that we cannot just off the catheter, we can do a catheter salvage whereby we keep the catheter or exchange and treat with antibiotics. And later on, once infection-free, we exchange again. AVF and ABG, a thrombosis AVF can be uh, re recanalized the excess again by thrombectomy. And PD catheter block can uh, also uh, be done by catheter adjustment if it is migrated. Termination part, of course, uh, CVC or HDC will be removal. AVF, AVG ligation for a few purposes, either uh, due to after transplant and or patient in high output failure and PD removal in a, in a patient whereby uh, it got infected or maybe uh, switching uh, to another modality like transplant or hemodialysis. So this is the kidney disease progression or natural history and the care model uh, that's currently available in Malaysia. From this side, you can see the kidney progress from normal if there's an insults in between which is diabetes, hypertension, common nephritis, and any other causes of acute kidney injury or pedirity causes may increase, risk of, increase the risk of kidney failure, subsequently kidney damage, which is a term of a chronic kidney disease, reduced kidney function, and eventually kidney failure. So when the kidney damage at the stage of acute kidney injury, uh, intervention can be prevented. And once prevented, the kidney may be normal back to the uh, recover back to normal GFR, or maybe it will progress to chronic kidney disease of stage 2, 3, 4, or even 5. And some even straight away to end stage, like those uh, very active lupus nephritis, very aggressive uh, lupus nephritis, and, and uh, aggressive anti-GBM uh, disease. And for those with kidney damage or CKD stage, may have another insult of acute kidney injury, what we call as acute on CKD. And once recovered, it may be recovering at the level of a lower than before, like maybe from three to four or five. What happens if there's no intervention? Of course, death is inevitable. So the options will be PD, peritoneal disease, dialysis, kidney transplant, or palliation, as mentioned earlier on. Don't be surprised, after a few years, PD may switch to uh, dialysis for a few reasons, infection, poor membrane uh, exchange, and so on and so forth, or patients fatigue, and so on and so forth. 
can be uh, changed to transplant. Once the uh, transplant uh, opportunity is there, can always transplant even though a patient with on PD. And uh, some may actually choose uh, palliation after that when uh, the membrane fails. Likewise, hemodialysis also can change PD when a uh, heart is weak or not suitable for hemodialysis anymore or even get transplanted. And likewise, transplant may have end stage again and prior to the end stage, we need to explore on the options again or uh, life kidney, uh, ESKD plan again. And ultimately, if anyone choose palliation care, we, our team, uh, palliative physician or our uh, this uh, palliative nephrology may ensure a patient uh, have a symptom-free symptom -free death. So from the legends itself, how, how does the system work at the moment? On the left side would be the nephrologist and the hybrid nephrologist, I would say, general nephrology, general uh, glomerular nephrology, critical care nephrology, interventional nephrology, transplant nephrology, and palliative nephrology. For the non-nephrologist who is taking care of the kidney patient will be general physician or internal medicine specialist, palliative physician, vascular surgeons, urologists, upper GI surgeons, interventional neurologists, and intensivists. Where do they fit in? General physician or internal uh, uh, medicine specialist will take care from the early CKD up to the near end stage. ICU intensivists will take care when it's AKI together with critical care nephrologists. Global nephrologists, nephrologists can take care of the um, these uh, global nephrologists. And for access, mainly by urologists for capital insertion, upper GI surgeons, and we are lucky that in UM, we have nephrologist team involved in PD uh, access insertion as well. General nephrology will take care of the prescription of the PD. Vascular surgeons will uh, try to uh, prepare the EVF access while the on trans transition to hemodialysis. Urologists uh, will be involved in transplant. Vascular surgeon uh, prepared uh, access again. Interventional radiologists will uh, do a, get the EVF salvage or physioplasty for patient with access uh, 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 dysfunction. And whereas general nephrology will ensure the care of uh, transfer from HD and P to PD and general nephrology in charge of the PD prescription. Urologists help to transplant patient, uh, either a new end stage or patient already on hemodialysis. And transplant nephrologists actually in charge of these uh, 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 patient selections and immunological preparations and also continuation of care with uh, general nephrologists. And palliative, physici palliative physicians and palliative nephrologists taking care for a patient opted for this uh, palliative, palliative care. All right, the summary at this point, equitable access to dialysis access care. I'm sure everyone knows about that, okay? Dialysis access is needed for hemodialysis patient to undergo life-saving and life-maintaining treatment, either HD or PD, plus and minus patient on interim uh, uh, dialysis catheter while awaiting for transplant or tank of catheter insertion. Patient on hemodialysis and peritonalysis need needed uh, effective dialysis access to reduce morbidity and mortality. Dialysis access cycle of care will be from creation, maintenance, salvage, termination, recreation, and so on and so forth. And dialysis access creation are mainly uh, championed by vascular and urologists, maintained by vascular and interventional radiologists, and salvaged by vascular surgeon, uh, IR urologists, and termination by vascular and urologists except a uh, hemodialysis catheter where nephrologists still manage at large, as, at least in PPUM. Now we go to about the equitable access. What do we, you mean by equitable access? It's actually a fair and reasonable way uh, that gives equal treatment. But equal treatment doesn't mean an effective treatment. If you share uh, the treatment accordingly, but some patient may not actually uh, benefit from it, we need to ensure equity, whereby certain population may need extra care to enable everyone gets the healthcare that we are, uh, are targeted to, right? So equitable is important to overall well-being in all medical healthcare, no matter in nephrology, interventional nephrology, or 
in any other subspecialty. So equitable in social interventions, equitable in structures of the care, equitable in experience of care, high quality clinical care, and of course, equitable access to care is one of the major uh, success factors. And what determines the access? It is access is actually the fit between the client and the system. First of all, is the availability of this access. The number of vascular surgeons as per the NSR uh, on this 4th March, 4 from MO, MOH, uh, sorry, 8 from MH, 8 from MOHE, and 19 in private sectors. Accessibility, relation between the location and the supply and the demand. Facilities with vascular access from the NSR as well. MOH, HKL, Kota Baru, QE, Queen Elizabeth in Sabah, Serdang. MOHE, UM, UKM, UPM, USF, and IIUM. How about accommodation? Relationship between organization of the service and client's needs. Of course, government facilities with vascular service versus without. Affordability will be a component of government versus a private. Acceptability will be depending on the vascular surgeon versus non-vascular surgeons. Acceptability in the management of the above uh, mentioned care. And mind you, our total population as of 2024 is 34 million point six, 34.6 million and it's climbing up every year. And we have a few uh, surgeons or, or IRs to manage. Okay, this is the modest proposal 24 years ago by a, uh, a nephrologist, uh, currently the pioneer of the intervention nephrologist, Dr. Charles O'Neill from the US. So the conventional approach Imagine that you are the nephrologist or yourself as a patient. That is what is written in that sharing. A patient presents to you with advanced renal failure of unknown duration. Ultrasound of the following day by radiologists. Well, majority of our hospital in Malaysia can't get the ultrasound uh, the following day unless get admitted. Uh, and some justification. And showing the echogenicity of the normal site without hydronephrosis. You decided for biopsy. Uh, you decided uh, for biopsy is needed and is performed in the regional department the next afternoon. Not possible in government hospital, right? Uh, and in the sense that uh, in the next day, uh, thanks, uh, even in UM also, the earliest, uh, maybe we get admitted and biopsy tomorrow, that's still possible. But yes, our patient probably within a week or two. Therefore, you see the biopsy. Severe fibrosis and common uh, sclerosis, meaning that the, all the kidney tissue are scarred. Patient becoming overloaded the next day, or maybe on the same day, you call the vascular surgeon to put in the tunnel cuff catheter uh, after this, uh, his scheduled surgeries. This is happening in the US. It is 6 p.m. when you and the nurses uh, uh, start patient on hemodialysis. Two days later, you send back the vascular surgeon for AVF creation, but an AVG was created instead due to probably time or maybe patients uh, and not many uh, vessel size too small or so and so forth. Eight months later, the AV graft thrombos. You call the intervention radiologist who scheduled the next day after several more important cases. The next day you get called down to the registry department as the patient is too short of breath. Imagine hemodialysis indicated, you bring the patient to the hemodialysis unit for femoral catheter insertion and dialysis. And now it's too late to declot the graft and patient has to wait for the next day or maybe the next few days. Now, picture a little bit different approach. The nephrologist rolls an ultrasound machine into the patient's room on the same day of admission, quickly determines the biopsy is needed, marks the kidney, and then performs the biopsy. The biopsy results available the next day. Later that day, nephrologist plays a tunnel cuff catheter, knowing the fact that it is not possible to salvage. Dialysis is performed the next non-limb, after which patient is sent for vascular studies for the upper extremity uh, for a vessel mapping. And nephrologist reviews these uh, studies and then calls the vascular surgeon to discuss with him the feasibility of the fistula. Alternatively, nephrologist inserts the Tankov catheter and begins the peritoneal analysis if there's no option for AVF patient. If even needed, patient can be discharged day three and the fistula is created as an outpatient pr uh, prior to the dialysis day. And the patients with a thrombograph is sent to a procedure suit when the nephrologist removes the thrombus, perform angiogram, and then dilates the stenosis. If the graft cannot be salvaged, nephrologist place the tunnel cuff catheter right there and then. 
and the patients then return to the outpatient dialysis unit for his treatment. Is it a fantasy? I would say no, because there is a population of newly emerged interventional nephrologists, or we call it new nephrologists. So interventional nephrologists is defined as a new and emerging subspecialty of nephrology that mainly deals with ultrasonography of the kidneys, ultrasound, guided renal biopsy, insertion of the perinodialysis catheter, tunnel dialysis catheter as a vascular access for patients undergoing hemodialysis, as well as per kidneys endovascular procedure performed to manage the dysfunction of AVF or AVG in the end-stage renal patient. At some centers, like Japan, the nephrologist in charge of AVF, AVG creation, and also surgical re uh, revision. And how does interventional nephrology fits into this system? Here, 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 and here. From the CVC or the tunnel cuff catheter insertion, the access, timely access preparation, conversion in between, and also uh, mainly in the population of dialysis access. So this will sort of like conclude my topic or the title, equitable access to the intervention nephrologies in the involvement of the dialysis access care for end-stage kidney patient. Yes, we have a different training background. Of course, vascular surgeons have the upper hand on managing the dialysis access, second by the IR and nephrologies for us, probably we just maintain the patient by prescription of dialysis prescription and well-being. But not many have an equitable access. Why don't we make it equity, equitable for every team to involve in dialysis access to provide an equitable access care to the end-stage uh, patient as a whole, together as a team? How relevant is IN in Malaysia? This is the latest uh, registry from the uh, MSN or Malaysian Society of Nephrology. 10 years ago, a new dialysis patient throughout Malaysia is 6,000. Every year climbing up uh, uh, to a new dialysis patient of currently 9,592 as in year 2020 of new end-stage disease patient requiring dialysis. And how many are on uh, how many patients are currently on dialysis? 29,000 as of 10 years ago, 51,000 as of 2022. And mind you, HDPD consists of 96.4%. There are a lot of things for us to do. And we can see with survival from the PD, HD, transplant, and graft survival, meaning that how long does this treatment uh, allow the patient to survive? First year is up 87% for PD, 24% 10 years. Hemodialysis, 88%, 28 10 years. Transplant, 96, 71 and graft survival 92 and 53 at 10 years. Of course, with uh, transplant rate has been climbing up slowly, but majority are still on PDHD. And just imagine only out of 10, only two or three alive in 10 years time. That's the reason why I go to Japan, the center uh, of the intervention nephrology. If you compare the dialysis population survival, relation 88%, and 10 years, 24, they are double of our survival. Okay, The whole nation, national of the Japan, 90 90% uh, 90 first year survival, 40% 10 years. Kaikokai, which is the center that I attached to, 98%, and 60% at 10 years. So who involved in dialysis access endovascular uh, uh, intervention? From the Kedoki guideline of 2019, in fact, it is mentioned, Operators, clinical experience, and expertise. Who consists of operators, nephrologists, interventionalists, or, or IR, and surgeons, or whoever that is trained to do that? So these are uh, were the training that I received from uh, Japan and also SGH. I've got another two colleagues who are trained, uh, Dr. Haikal from UPM, who are trained in Egypt, and Dr. Vinod from KKM, who are trained in the same center. That's uh, 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 trained uh, in Japan. So, as of UN, UMC nephrology's role at the moment, we can do ultrasound kidney, of course, not formal. Formal, it still goes to the radiologist. Ultrasound ki uh, guided kidney biopsy, tunnel cuff or non tunnel cuff catheter insertion, tank cuff catheter insertion, salting good and open surgical lab, mini laboratory technique by nephrologist in UMC. And I believe it's only in UMC. 
you ultrasound, AVF, and AVG mapping and assessment. This is a new service. Endovascular intervention, fistulogram, fistuloplasty, thrombectomy, central venoplasty, stenting, complex vascular uh, catheter intervention, AVF, AVG creation, and surgical creation, question mark, as of now, not yet. So the improvement of dialysis access care since June 2023, when uh, we have this service, simple and complex fistuloplasty, central venoplasty, So there's a tightening of the fistula that requires a very very established type of fistula. So this is called fistula. In certain cases, when I just plant it, it's when the fistula is going to be able to do this, and you do, and then finish the fistula and enlarge it. And and to allow the fistula to function again, as this will be without with interim hemodialysis taken, depending on the severity of the need of the dialysis. And this is a fistula that's treated one year, not used. And scans noted as a very tight stenosis or, or a very tight junction or regulation or, or, or. Then we dilate it. So, another tightening. Tightening is opened up. And it can be used immediately. All right. Also involved in the stenting of the AVG. Stenting is placed in a, a dialysis access that collapses frequently as part of intervention. Okay. Left basilic vein access in uh, the complex uh, uh, dialysis access intervention whereby a recurrent insertion of this uh, dialysis catheter may actually induce a, a stenosis, and this is a total occlusion. So what we do is, we balloon it to open up the channel again, while awaiting for the fistula creation on the right side of the stem. Firing shift balloon disruption, which is not so known uh, uh, for beforehand, but uh, is already known in literature, but the the pickup rate is uh, not much. So far, there were three or four cases that we pick up. These are the fibrin shift that forms that cause catheter dysfunction. How differently we do, we have to balloon it to crack open up the, the fibrin shift. And then after that, once we, re, re, we establish the, can the recanalization, then we will put in the catheter again. And diagnostic central vitreum during the catheter exchange and insertion to plan for future uh, access. So practically, this patient has an IVC that has already been occluded. And we try to venogram on the right side, see any other options, which has no options at all. And we did a full histogram or central venogram, uh, central venogram to identify what is the next plan. And we noted that the right basic vein is still actually patent. And we get the immediate attention by our vascular surgeons to make an AV graph at the basilic. External jugular tunnel cuff catheter insertion in cases with exhaustive dialysis access, whereby IJC, femoral, and so on and so forth, there's no access and there's no PD access as, as well. And we enter through the external jug and put in a TCC. If you have assessment and cannulation and site replanning by marking a new marking uh, to allow the nurse to cannulate it more. Uh, to increase the success rate of cannulation and prevention of a hematoma. Combine urgent interventions, combine team efforts, whereby uh, vascular and IN attended an ulcerated BCF AVF bleeding uh, post decannulation. And we went in, we, we, we secured the bleeding and we relieved the central vein stenosis that caused the back pressure. And we market an uh, area for a nurse to cannulate and these are the combined teams that work on it. And role of UMC interventional phrase, what are the roles? Mainly complementing vascular surgeons and interventional readers in dialysis says endovascular intervention in hoping to reduce waiting time and prevent prevention the cancellation due to lack of manpower and also to avoid 
catheter related bloodstream infection in a patient on long term temporary dialysis catheter or or a tunnel cuff catheter. Identification of potential complex cases with exhausted and limited vascular access and manage, uh, and manage it or co-manage it. Collaboration in AVF clinics. Collaboration in identifying access that requires urgent or emergent uh, dialysis access intervention at AVF clinics. Collaboration in improvement of dialysis access care initiatives. UMMC thrombectomy protocol. Alert AV, alert HTC and enhanced HTC. Collaborating in uh, dialysis access researches like the ongoing one, ultrasound guided physioplasty versus fistolo, uh, uh, sorry, fluoroscopic guided uh, plasty, OVA or, or plain balloon versus a scoring balloon, ultrasound stiff test in predicting central vein stenosis with the IRs. So these are the dialysis access team, not to forget our own team, renal team, who plays an important role in managing a dialysis access uh, a dialysis patient. And this is the summary and end of my talk. As what Dr. Cheng has mentioned, this talk is in conjunction with kidney health for all, advancing equitable access to care and optimal medication practice. But for IN's view, on top of this, we should provide equitable access to dialysis access care for end-stage kidney patients and equitable access for IN to, to provide dialysis access care as a team. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Gan, for the very informative talk. Uh, are there any questions from the uh, online participants? If you have, you can uh, type in the chat box or the Q&A. Uh, maybe I should start off with the first question first. Um, so, Dr. Gan, you mentioned that up to 65%, if I'm not mistaken, of uh, hemodialysis initiation in Malaysia is unplanned. So, this is a very uh, huge, uh, staggering figure. So, what factors do you believe contribute to this trend? And uh, what strategies do you propose to mitigate these uh, unplanned initiations? Well, this unplanned, thank you for your uh, good question. Uh, well, yes, 65% is staggering uh, huge. And you can observe actually from our neighboring country, it's the same as well, like example, Thailand. Um, I Practically in Malaysian settings, a lot of last minute in the sense that our patients' education is actually... Um, even though you have already told them at the stage three, the acceptability is still not there. So one of the ways actually to encourage education, uh, empower them and, and let them know early beforehand that they really uh, need to prepare. That will be the very first step. Second step will be, of course, simultaneously, the healthcare uh, 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 team to understand more what is the importance of ESKT uh, life plan, where, whereby uh, you need to uh, have your team of the even GPs to understand what is the life plan that we have so that we can do together. And, and uh, of course, this will lead to a more planned uh, this, uh, 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 access preparation. And the main reason that the Japanese has got a very good outcome that I observe are that apart from their patients are very obedient, um, probably because the involvement of nephrology uh, in the dialysis access intervention and care in their system itself, probably could have speed up the the, the process, and 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 they can actually uh uh, uh create a fistula uh, and just try to wait within two weeks and cannulate it within two weeks and and even even though it's not really planned, uh, but they still manage to salvage it. I, I suppose that is the way collaboration is the way, and 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 that will should be the way to to go ahead for these uh, 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 efforts to reduce the unplanned uh, uh, preparation. Yeah, of course, patients' education, doctors' uh, education, and the acceptability to work together as a team. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think I think what you say is true, Dr. Gan. I think uh, the collaboration between all the managing uh, doctors and the, the uh, patient awareness is also um, equally important in making sure that you know, all our patients, when they are initiated on dialysis, is a plan instead of uh, uh, all the, the 65%, which is unplanned. Right, so we have a question uh, from the uh, audience. So, um, Associate Professor Wan Ahmad Hafiz is asking, um, how about the cost? Uh, because the uh, interventional nephrology service sounds expensive. So, how um, can we make sure that, you know, it is accessible to um, ordinary patients? 
Right. Thank you, Dr. Hafiz, uh, Prof. Hafiz. Um, this is a very, very uh, valid question. It sounds expensive in short term, but it may even more expensive in long term. Just imagine a patient with temporary dialysis catheter in between while waiting for AVF creations or, or transplant or PD and got infected and re-admitted again. And another catheter was, uh, uh, the, the infected catheter was taken out and they put on the other side and indirectly inducing another central vein stenosis. And there will be a multiple admissions prior to the success AVF creation. And by then, patients has already exhausted excess and central vein stenosis and patient not suitable for AVF creation. And with that admission, antibiotics, dialysis, extra dialysis, that will definitely, if, if in long run, if you do a microcosting, it should be more expensive. And of course, about economics, I'm not the expert in econs. If there's a, 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 a more supply, I mean, more, more interventions is done with the volume itself. Yes, the intervention kits are very expensive, 1,000 minimum, 2,000. But of course, volume will actually bring down the cost if it is used, used largely. This is how the economics works, I suppose. And when, when the volume is huge, we can always, uh, I believe, uh, discuss with our industrial partner to drop the price or create a more competitive price to, to, to actually make this intervention affordable by the ma vast majority of our patient. And, and yes, of course, this is one of the studies that I plan to do to see long-term patient with a, 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 a proper access uh, 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 creation and and timely manner creation versus the one not timely and probably we can see we, and we can answer whether interventional nephrology or, or these interventions are expensive or not yep right okay yeah I, I think that's a very relevant study you know to see whether uh, this upfront cost will it be justified over the long term um, whether are we uh, saving uh, more money in the, the long term or you know, but yeah, we'll be waiting for the uh, results of your study. Uh, so one of the uh, audience has brought up a very relevant uh, point. Uh, so Sarah has mentioned that I, uh, I guess this is probably in relevance to my previous question. Uh, it's, she says that, you know, the, it must be quite an anxious time, I presume, in those who are, you know, uh, going to initial dialysis. So do we get um, psychiatrists involved um, to reduce the resistance and perhaps, you know, to get them to accept this better. Right. Uh, thank you for the good question. And I think it's a very valid and very relevant. Uh, of course, as of now, the main resistance uh, that we face is more towards uh, 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 the acceptance. And this is a good point to explore whether is it the anxiety uh, parts that actually makes them worry more and undecided. I, I think... Uh, Dr. Sarah or, or Prof. Sarah, you, 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 you make up a very good point. I think our team should look into this where probably we can start looking at uh, uh, body language and from conversation. If we think that patient's anxious, we should get our psychiatrist in, uh, come in to uh, colleague to have a help. And definitely, this is a very good idea. I, I, I really uh, think that uh, this should be adopted and I think our team is uh, readily accept this. And yes, this is a very, very good, valid point. Thank you very much for bringing it up. Mm, yeah, I fully concur with you. I think uh, this is probably one of the aspects that we do not often look into. So perhaps you can get our counselling and uh, psychiatry colleagues to help us out uh, if you know we have patients who are um, either resistant or hesitant about this. Okay, so another question uh, from uh, another attendee is uh, he's asking, uh, he or she is asking, um, how often can intervention procedures be performed? And uh, do patients often arrive and get diagnosed in a timely manner suitable for intervention? Yeah. <clears throat> so as of the question, it is a very relevant and very real life. Um, as of now, the patient's uh, dialysis access dysfunctions are mainly picked up, are mainly referring from the uh, satellite hemodialysis or community hemodialysis center, uh, apart from inpatient ward or, or, or clinics or, or inpatient. Majority of about are from the community. And that will very much depending uh timely, very much depending on how how fast the nephrologist or the, the 
person in charge pick up the problem and refer to the vascular surgeon. Vascular surgeon will then assess in probably one week or two weeks' time, if not a month, due to the busy clinic. And, and also, uh, once reviewed, the need plastic will refer to IR for another uh, the of almost often occupied outpatient uh, list. And the intervention could be up to three weeks, two weeks the fastest, or maybe even one month or two months, right? And and most often, some uh, stenosis fistula may become thrombosis later on, and patient may need to insert the catheter. And and this is the real scenario pictures. And and as of how long the waiting time, uh, we are still doing audit from our side with the IR team. And I believe we will come up with the result soon later on. And, and from the general observation, it, it, it is around two to three weeks time or four weeks time. And what I can know is that even the IR actually fits back. Hey, lately, we got a lot of thrombectomy and also physioplasty. We used to have very rare thrombectomy. And as of last week, we got, we got four to five or six. Uh, sorry, last week. Yeah, yes, last week, four to five thrombectomies to salvage the fistula. And this week, maybe one or two. Uh, uh, sorry, this week itself uh, was scheduled for. Yeah. And, and they were saying uh, in climbing uh, 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 trend. Where, where where the thrombectomy to salvage the uh, the AVF is getting more accepted. And and how to improve that? Yes, we as the nephrologists, IN efforts, uh, will try to educate the young doctors or the uh, aspired nephrologists or currently the fellow nephrologists to be trained in dialysis access detection, clinically, uh, clinical dysfunction, and to get more awareness, like I say, uh, awareness not about patient, it's also our healthcare team on how to detect it and refer early. And of course, if the vascular surgeons are busy, I am probably can complement to actually evaluate and discuss if there's some limitation that we think that vascular uh, need vascular surgeon input, we discuss. We need to know our limitation, we discuss. And if I ask about IR colleague, are you free to do? If not free to do, uh, can I do? Yes, of course. Uh, it will be a uh, more timely matter, yeah. Because everyone's are busy, and and of course, uh, as I and we try to actually, uh, 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 get it done as soon as possible to prevent the excess thrombosis rather than dysfunction, and we need to uh, have another catheter. Yep, I think that that is how we should look forward. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think we're set, set setting off in the right direction. So hopefully, you know, when there are more, uh, the, the uh, people who are involved, the vascular, the IRs, you know, once we have a larger team, then you know, we can provide better service. So another question um, from the attendees would be, uh, are you providing the service uh, 24 hours around the clock, including weekends? All right. As of now, un on unofficially, there are cases that I and uh, vascular team go in hand in hand in operation data whereby open trapectomy is uh, needed and inpatient or intraoperative uh, plastic we did uh, one case before. And some complex catheter that uh, that requires, uh, uh, or I would say non-stable and requires immediate plastic in OT, uh, uh, I, so far we still do give the service. Uh, of course, it was not compensated, which is fine because this is the effort that we are putting uh, in for now, and as of starting, uh, we can't be cooperative on that. And and to address the twenty four hours uh service, uh certain selective cases, uh because of this, uh, I mean, I N is new in U M, and we haven't laid out the, the 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 much proper uh pathway. But of course, efforts are there, like thrombotherapy protocol. We actually laid out uh, a patient came with a thrombosis fistula together with I R and a vascular team to come up with a a protocol whereby if the fistula got blocked, how fast, uh, where, how to go about, who to do, who, who to come in and, and plasty, how, what's the duration, depending on a uh, uh, type of the access and how's the duration of the block. As of now, the fistula that the, the AVF, a atrial venous fistula, the native fistula that is blocked within two weeks, we still manage, we still can salvage. Uh, and of course, the best one will be within 30, 30, uh, uh, 72 hours, which is a three days time. That would be the best outcome. 
end, but as long as two weeks, we're still able to salvage. And for AVG or AV graph, we can give up to uh, four weeks. And uh, there are certain cases, uh, one month or even one year, we try to salvage, uh, it's still successful. Yes, 24-hour service is what I'm planning, looking forward, uh, providing there's enough fluoroscopic room uh, or dedicated uh, interventional nephrology or uh, that is access room together to actually uh, manage for this access related problem. 24 hours is doable, but of course, we need to see what is the volume and what we can offer the service. Yes. Right. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Dr. Harris from our vascular surgeon also uh, uh, similarly echo your thoughts on that. I agree that there are a lot of factors being involved and not just the surgeons or the interventionists. Uh, we also need a lot in terms of uh, funding facilities and supporting staff. So, you know, hopefully in the future, um, we, we are able to get more funding, better facilities and more supporting staff uh, too, so that we can do our best for our patients, right? Uh, so maybe, uh, Dr. Dan, just let me ask you a question um, for the uh, non-nephrologists or maybe the non-medical doctors over there. So, you know, we commonly get uh, a very common question from our patients regarding the choice of dialysis, you know, between uh, peritoneal dialysis or hemodialysis. Uh, maybe perhaps you could elaborate on the considerations that um, you take when you uh, uh, consult the patient on this, along with the, maybe some of the pros and cons of um, each modality. Yep. Uh, as everyone knows, the dialysis exam modality will be HCPD. Of course, the best will be transplant because the data has showed that transplant has got a better outcome in sense of quality of life and also patient survival. But uh, unfortunately, the transplant rate is not so high uh, for several factors. And 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 majority landed up uh, 96% ended up in uh, either PDHD and majority uh, 86% will be on hemodialysis. Uh, which one is good? Which one is bad? I will look at the uh, as overall uh, economic uh, suitability as a patient and the facilities that are available, and and for for a patient with peritoneal dialysis, the good one is that the patient may have still residual urine function, which may actually uh, uh, give a more better outcome of uh, 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 in the sense that if you can preserve the renal function for up to residual renal function up to one to two years, and definitely the survival outcome is, is better. And, and But for, for, for PD, uh, uh, those, with who, who, those patients who are enthusiastic and uh, like to self-empower, probably they are, they are more prone to, to this uh, uh, PD rather than uh, HD. And, and, and some patients actually prefer hemodialysis is because uh, it is done as outpatient and poked by the nurses. So they are kind of like, maybe need some help for the, the cannulation or, or to receive the hemodialysis. And talking about the cost, and hemodialysis are uh, 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 around two to 3,000 per month, whereas PD is actually in KKM, the reimbursement is, is just like patient have to pay 100 ringgit per month and, and in PPU and 700 ringgit per month. And of course, everyone wants a Lamborghini and I, uh, and I can only afford Exora, and that is why I buy Exora. So everyone wants the hemodialysis, but if let's say financial status is kind of a bit restricted, and, and I will prone to actually say, look, uh, PD is more achievable. That is the only accessible for now. Maybe we can crowdfunding whatsoever uh, to, to get the hemodialysis later on, we are not sure. So, so that very much depending on the, the coverage of the, uh, uh, the financial coverage of this uh, treatment. And of course, I'm very pro PD uh, in the sense that uh, we we can actually keep the residual renal function, and once uh, uh, the PD has used up uh, for or or maybe not so well PD anymore, we can always uh, transfer to HD, which is more easier uh, rather than HD transfer to PD due to the fluid extraction uh, uh, issue. And and of course, a patient with heart failure, severe heart failure, we actually can't dialyze the patient or a very bad heart failure. Uh, even though if you create a fistula, it may not actually mature. Uh, or maybe a patient with heart failure, you continue dialysis, we may actually kill the patient even faster. That defeat the purpose. So PD is uh, the way. And there's no right, there's no wrong. Uh, PD and HD to me is uh, equal. And if you if either plan that we can uh, go, I would say transplant first. If no transplant chance, PD and then HD and palliative. And, and, and that is a multifactorial. Right. Thank you for your answer, Dr. Dan. Yeah, 
Uh, I fully concur with you that you know we need to advocate a transplant as a first option in those who are suitable. Uh, but I, the thing to talk about that will be another day. Um, so are there any other questions from the uh, uh, members of our audience? Uh, so maybe uh, while waiting for them to type their questions, I'd just like to ask you another question. Uh, um, so, you know, as our um, healthcare in Malaysia is evolving uh, over the last decade, um, you know, uh, interventional nephrologists like you, uh, you face many uh, challenges, uh, especially to start off the service uh, in delivering your um, dialysis access care. Yes. Um, so what uh, challenges do you foresee um, in your field and you know um, what are the strategies that you are thinking of to to overcome all these challenges effectively right so um it is even in international level uh, uh except from japan uh, singapore and other countries turf issue is always the the main limiting factors for a successful team and i'm glad that um uh, vascular surgeons team uh ir team are very open for us to work together as a team. And I'm glad that I do not face so much of a uh, hurdle uh, to, to, to actually uh, uh, provide this service. And we have, I would say, UMMC. I would proudly say that UMMC so far is the, 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 the team uh, that consists of uh, IR, first class surgeon, and nephrologists uh, work hand in hand in the uh, access. And of course, uh, the key of success is always uh, in mutual respect, we need to respect uh, uh, our capability and also our limitation and also respect whatever policy that we have. And in hoping that we work together with a good faith that to improve the outcome and, and sooner or later, uh, uh, each party will open up uh, uh, more to, for us to involve uh, together uh, in, in a more advanced manner or, or, or timely manner. Uh, with the purpose of complementing. Like, if you can't do it, you can do it as long as patient is not that postponed. And, and I, I, I foresee UMMC vascular access team or dialysis access team has got a very exciting challenge, uh, not challenges, I would say as exciting um, uh, moments to go ahead in uh, promoting service and research and also to educate the new, uh, 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 how to say, the new the doctors yeah that that is what i see uh for now yeah right okay thank you very much so i think we'll take one last question uh so uh and then you want to ask your opinion on how we can improve the equitable access to interventional nephrology care doctor factors or cost factors and um, any measures have been taken to overcome these barriers all right. Um, like I said, when I landed uh, uh, back in Malaysia, uh, I was really lucky that the uh, vascular team and IR teams is all open a uh, uh, hand for, for IN to involve. Uh, not much of hurdle at the moment. And in fact, uh, vascular and IR teams allow uh, IN to piggyback or, or maybe co-manage together for these uh, 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 endovascular interventions. And, and of course, looking uh, in the bigger pictures, uh, of course, long term, we will need funding this and that. Uh, so uh, how to overcome the hurdle is by getting more data and, and digesting it. And, and all, 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 of course, not only digest it, we need to see what, uh, what uh, limitations to improve on it and, and the show, 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 show the data, uh, solid data, whereby uh, what has been done uh, 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 that, that, that can actually improve the, the care. And, and once uh, the patients got to know uh, uh, best care, then of course they will come to us and increase the UMMC's revenue, this and that. And probably we can discuss further for extra labs, this and that, mainly um, uh, 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 providing this uh, dialysis access intervention as a team. So different country has got different policy. I do uh, know the limitation. Like for example, in Japan, the nephrologists uh, can create fistula and that's their policy. Well. Uh, when in Japan, I eat sushi or ramen. If in Malaysia, then I eat nasi lemak, roti canai, or mee goreng, or chai kway teow. So, so, so we, we improvise it uh, according to policies, uh, laws. And, and the most important thing is patient benefit from the collaboration. And all teams has to be open-minded to, to collaborate together uh, for the patient's benefit. Uh, I, I think 
uh, hopefully I can answer uh, that. As for now, yes, we need more data, we need more research and, and, and audits to show that what is the effort uh, uh, has been done to improve. And of course, in long-term cost effectiveness uh, studies will be my long-term project to look into whether is it a cost saving or not, or whether does it generate uh, uh, ROI or so. Yeah, I'm looking forward for that. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for your feedback, Dr. Gan. So I think today um, we have talked much about, you know, the intricacies of dialysis access care. Um, we have explored strategies of dialysis access care encompassing uh, what you mentioned just now, creation, uh, maintenance, salvage, termination, and also recreation when necessary. All right. So uh, in, I guess uh, that's uh, all the time we have for today. So um, in closing, I would like to um, express uh, my appreciation uh, to all the participants for your questions and answers and your participation in this webinar. And uh, let's uh, hope that we can all do our best for our patients and we can uh, give them the best of care for all our patients with our chronic kidney disease. And uh, with that, I think I would like to draw a close to this um, uh, episode of uh, Breakfast at UM Health. Uh, thank you everyone for your time and uh, please uh, 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 do, your, do our best and uh, please enjoy the uh, events that we have organized for the World Kidney Day 2024. Right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, everyone.